and uh, welcome to Rob Wheeler's talk. He's fresh here from Lancashire, where he's been researching the five foot town surveys in this month's magazine. I hope you've all enjoyed reading it. And uh, I pay credit again to him and to Richard Oliver as being our stalwart suppliers of good reading in sheet lines. Richard, don't give it up, whatever you do. Um, and uh, so welcome everyone. Tonight's uh, title has disappeared from my screen, but it's uh, Rob. Adding railways to the old series, which you should have up at the moment. You should have the title up at the moment. So yeah. I do. Yes, that's your title, not mine. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Here we, here we go. Over to you, Mr. Starter. Rob. OK. Um, I should explain that I'm not going to go through the, uh, the details on policy, which Richard has already covered in his book. What I'm doing this evening is looking at the nitty gritty of how lines were added uh, particularly looking at what the, the surveyors must have done, and uh, sometimes at least what the engravers uh, were doing. The reason for this is that I had noticed that, um, particularly with regard to the additional features, non-railway features that got added, there was a lot of commonality locally uh, but variation across the, the country. And I wondered if it was possible to talk about different styles and to map the boundaries of those styles. Let us start with what may have been the first sheet to have a, a railway added to it. Various things appear here which were not persisted with. Um, one is this excessively verbose title, you know, Grand <coughs> Junction Railway from Liverpool to Birmingham. Uh, that got dropped fairly soon. The other thing that was not persisted with uh, was the depiction of bounding ditches alongside the railway. Now, these were quite genuine and substantial bounding ditches. Um, Locke, the engineer, had had quite some difficulty with the, the Moorish ground uh, on this section and the, the, fail, the difficulty of getting a stable base for the, uh, the formation. Um, and his only, the only solution he could come up with was uh, draining away as much of the water as possible with large flanking ditches. The trouble is, if you have these large flanking ditches, you end up depicting the railway line by uh, four longitudinal lines, of which the two middle ones are joined by sleepers, and it takes up too much space. The sort of consequence you get, you can see at Hay House in the middle of this um, excerpt, where the, uh, the house appears to be, or some of the outbuildings, appear to be falling into the, uh, the railway flanking ditches. And indeed, the approach road to the, uh, the house actually uh, impinges on railway property. This was partly caused by the, the width of the symbol. It was also uh, partly because the uh, planimetric accuracy of the original survey here was not what you might expect it to have been. Um, Hay House was definitely shown <laughs> rather further to the northeast than it actually is. And if you look on a, a later edition of the map, you can see that Hay House is actually a respectable distance from the railway line. Um, likewise, Maidley Manor Farm, if you compare uh, the, the old series with the, uh, the new series, you find that um, the orientation is wrong. It really does look as though it's the same buildings surviving, um, but um, you know, they were not mapped very accurately. And of course, whether things line up in a straight line was always one of the more demanding tests of 
planimetric accuracy. And railways, mainline railways like this, did tend to impose straight lines on the maps. If we move just a little bit north of Hay House, and I'm hoping you can see my pointer here, though it may be a bit small, um, you will see this stream. In fact, it's, the stream runs northwards, uh, meandering here. And, oh, it meanders under, under the railway and does a bit of meandering there, uh, dis goes off to the east again, um, and then up into Maidley. The reason for this is that the engraver was working very economically uh, and was not disposed to make um, more deletions than were absolutely necessary. Deletions, of course, being much more troublesome than additions. Um, and likewise, down here by the, the V of Liverpool, you, you've got existing streams which uh, continue in their old position, despite the fact that there's a railway line plonked on top of them. Of course, some deletion was necessary. The, the road from Maidley Manor, um, if you look at the old version, went up to Maidley past the town hall. Um, once the railway had been built, that was truncated at the town hall and the road was rerouted to run alongside the railway line un until it reached the Turnpike Road um, where it had a T-junction. If you look at the map, uh, the T-junction is not with the Turnpike Road, it is with this side road, but um, you know, that's a pr another problem with the width of the railway symbol. And again, the engraver is being economical. He has not broken the, the casing of the existing road where the new road joins it. Anyway, enough of that sheet. If we move to the, uh, just about the next sheet down, uh, there are other instructive things to look at. And here I've just got three versions of the same state um, with different degrees of, of enlargement. So if you start in the north and you get down to C, at C we have what is a fairly normal phenomenon. The road has been diverted in order to cross the railway more efficiently, um, more economically. And um, th that's standard. I, I will take that sort of alteration as uh, given. If you carry on a bit further, you can see that streams are now being deleted when they go under the railway line. They're not being rerouted, which this almost certainly would, would have been, but of course rerouting would involve a, a parallel uh, watercourse to the, the railway and then going across it at right angles. And they were trying to avoid those parallel watercourses. If you carry on down to Bowers Bent, uh, we've got an enlargement here on the middle extract, and you can see quite clearly there that the, the, the outer lines of the railway have been engraved in hairline across the road. Um, and then when it came to add the sleepers, those butt up against the road. Um, it's not an ideal way of doing it. From Standard Mill southwards, this road had to be diverted a little to run alongside the railway line. Um, and then we carry on to the right hand extract. And when we get down here, down to the, uh, the extreme southern end of the extract, we have this expanse of water that has appeared. What's happening here is that railway engineers normally uh, chose their levels such that the amount of spoil being taken from cuttings approximately matched the amount of fill needed for embankments. Consequently, you know, it all evened out and there was no lack of material or surplus of material. But they didn't always get it right. And what happened here was clearly a lack of material and the borrow pit was constructed alongside the railway line, which was allowed to fill with water and became part of the hydrology of the area. 
One other observation, which may or may not be important, um, if you look at the, uh, if you especially if you, if you lay a ruler against the, the map, you will see that the, the curve starts at A. North of A, the line is just about straight. South of A, it uh, embarks on a curve. If you look at later maps, that curve does seem to start at B. Um, this may be an indication of uh, inaccuracy of surveying. However, by the time the later maps were produced, the, uh, the line had been quadrupled. So it's possible that the quadrupling was uh, taken advantage of to smooth out that curve slightly. So quick summary. Um, That should be clear enough. Moving on to the next sheet, uh, I haven't got the, or I haven't been able to look at a pre-railway state here, because although there was a pre-railway state, um, Marguerite shows state two. But one of the things that got added to that state is this thing here, police station. Now, I think what we have here is a reference to uh, bobbies uh, being the, the customary railway term at this date for signalmen. And this is effectively saying we've got an early signal box here. That at least is my interpretation. Uh, there may be railway experts who are able to uh, tell me later on I've got it wrong. If we carry on further down on this sheet, uh, now looking at three uh, successive states, then um, it's really quite instructive. The earliest state here on the left has just, <laughs> just the, uh, the track symbol uh, with again hairline running across the road in case you're, you noticed that. Um, The earthworks were added later on, and a problem arose because space hadn't been left to engrave the the, uh, the, uh, the cutting. Yes, it is a cutting, and so we have the earthworks overly, overlying this little cottage here, and also uh, overlying or broken for uh, this S bend of the road. And then that got uh, corrected in the th a third bite at the cherry, uh, which is also when the mileages were put on. Um, and the cottage now seems to be largely deleted and the uh, alignment of the road has been changed, whether accurately or not, I do not know, but in such a manner that it doesn't get in the way of the earthworks. The 1837 was a really important year so far as uh, railway construction was concerned. Uh, nothing to do with Queen Victoria, uh, but uh, the result of a change in the standing orders of the House of Commons for private bills relating to railways. There had long been a requirement that the promoters of such bills should deposit plans uh, with the House of Commons and also with clerks of the peace for all the counties involved, uh, with copies to all the parishes in involved. Um, not that they survive very often. The, the new rules stated that the minimum scale for these plans uh, was now four inches to the mile. If there was a, uh, a, a house or the curtilage of a house falling within the, the lines of deviation of the railway, then an even larger scale was required. And a lot of surveyors did actually do everything at that larger scale to avoid the, uh, the complication of having to have lots of enlargements. Um, the consequence of this was that it was perfectly possible to send a draftsman along to uh, the parliamentary offices and to copy 
the proposed route of a railway onto a, uh, a proof or a, um, uh, a tracing of the one inch map. I mean, it's not a trivial matter because they're working from a strip map that only extends a few hundred yards each way. Uh, and what they traced might actually not be the uh, quite the line of the railway as it was built for two reasons. First of all, the plans were normally accompanied by a list of deviation that were allowed uh, without reference back to Parliament, normally 100 yards each side. This was so that the contractor uh, could, when he came to build the line, say, ah, it would be so much easier if I shifted it a bit to the left or a bit to the, a bit to the right. Um, and that, that attitude of, line, of limits of deviation did actually carry on as, as, as late as when the M1 motorway was being built. Uh, and if they wanted a larger deviation, well, it was relatively easy for the large companies simply to put in a supplementary clause in one of their later acts, because the large companies tended to be uh, promoting a, a private act for various things pretty well every couple of years. Um, and an extra clause of this nature, uh, it, assuming it was uncontroversial, and they would normally be uncontroversial, uh, did not really involve them in significant extra costs. So that is, I think, the explanation why some of the, uh, the railways, as shown on the old series, do not actually correspond to the railways as built quite. Uh, but of course, you can have greater problems than that. And uh, they made a false start by putting the projected alignment of the Eastern Counties Railway on four sheets in, Eastern, in East Anglia, as Richard has explained in his book. It was a particularly poor choice because the Eastern Counties Railway was perpetually short of money. Uh, it, it did everything late. And in this case, it was so late that the, the actual construction was carried out by a different company or companies on different alignments. So the, the lightly drawn um, projected Eastern Counties Railway was really a complete disaster. But they didn't abandon the approach altogether. And what we see elsewhere suggests a process where they weren't going to add anything on the engraved sheet until construction had started within that sheet. But at that point, it was then appropriate to add the course lightly. And one sees this with the Great Western Railway around Bristol, um, where projected course is shown on some of the early states. Um, this approach was actually quite helpful for the surveyors, at least I believe it would have been quite helpful for the surveyors, because if you are um, surveying at ground level and you basically encounter the edge of a construction site, it's not really that easy sorting out where the center line of the permanent way is going to be ultimately. And you need to get that center line correct. Otherwise you will have a wiggly course of your line uh, when actually the line, if it's a, a major one like the Great Western, will be pretty straight. Um, so I think this was probably done for two reasons, both for uh, ensuring that the, the map user uh, had a, a product that was absolutely up to date and indeed uh, a little in advance of being up to date, and also to assist in the survey. The consequence of all this is that potentially and quite often actually, the addition of a railway to the old series could take place in four stages. First of all, you have the intended course. Then you have earthworks. Then you have stations added. And 
it may seem strange to the modern uh, listener, but the decision on where stations were going to be placed could sometimes be made just, just a couple of months before opening of the railway line. That was certainly the case with the Nottingham and Lincoln line. Um, and then finally, you had the, the mileages added. And I've been careful about using the word mileages there. You do not normally see mile posts uh, marked on the, the old series. And it seems quite possible that there was no general survey involved in the addition of mileages. It was simply a matter of noting uh, a couple of numbers in a couple of locations. And by measurement, you could interpolate uh, between them. The justification for mileages being that a certain number of travelers would equip themselves with the new printed guides uh, for uh, travelers on the, these new railways, explaining how after you had passed mile post 130, you could see on the left the, uh, the beautiful uh, medieval tower of Peatling Parva Church, etc. Taking four bites at the cherry like this can hardly have been cheap. And the, the justification uh, was that these were great national works, which therefore needed to be shown on the maps. That, that attitude to the railways tended to change round about 1840, because by 1840, there was a feeling, believe it or not, that the country had got all the railways it was really ever going to need. You've got the, the London and Birmingham carrying on as the great grand junction to uh, the Liverpool and Manchester. Um, You'd got um, the, the Great Eastern, uh, sorry, the, um, the Eastern Counties Railway uh, going off towards uh, Cambridge and uh, Norwich, you'd got the, uh, the London and Brighton, you've got the London and Southampton, you've got the Great Western to Bristol. What else was anyone going to need? Um, and the fact that, say, Lincolnshire at this date had no railways at all um, did not seem a particular problem. It was quite clear from the Eastern Counties uh, Railway that uh, agricultural areas were not really going to yield very much in the way of profits. The consequence of this change of attitude was that um, those railways that started to appear after about 1840 uh, were treated much more economically. I don't think even the most enthusiastic Welshman would argue that the Taffail Railway, for example, was a great national work. And I believe that to have been the, the first line that was only engraved once in completed form, um, though it may be that the experts will correct me on that. Now, what I want to talk about particularly is what I've called associated revision, uh, putting things on the map at the same time as the railway, uh, which are in proximity to the railway, but which are not an inherent part of the railway. And if you look at the, the Great Western uh, near Slough, you find an example of an additional farm uh, being shown, you know, nothing to do with the railway, it just happens to be nearby, uh, about 1840. It's not an area where it's very easy to, to say exactly what's happening um, because there's quite a lot of general revision going on, but this seems to be outside the area of general revision. It does really appear to be railway associated revision. But what I really want to talk about are a couple of later instances. Um, the London and South Western Railway, the line from what is now called Eastleigh down to Portsmouth, and the London Northwestern uh, just south of the Menai Straits. 
taking the the London and South Western first, my extract here has uh, got I've gone over in blue those things that have been added to the the map at the same time as the railway, and in red I try and show those things that have been deleted from the map, and one of the most one of the biggest changes up here, um, up in the, the northwest corner, is where the railway crosses a stream. And the crossing point seems to be much the same. Uh, but whereas before the stream was following a natural meandering course down to the river Itchin, I suppose it is there, um, in the interests of improved land drainage, uh, a a course has been run parallel to the Itchen, joining the Itchen further down. And the view seems to have been taken that the, the railway, the, 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 when the railway is added, the feature in the immediate vicinity of the railway needs to be shown correctly. And you can't have a stream that just appears from nothing there and just disappears there. And so you've got to follow the stream until it gets back to the original course here, or indeed follow it down in this direction until it reaches the Itchen. Carrying on in a southeasterly direction, we've got a couple of new roads that have been added here, and uh, there was a wood here that got deleted. Here, I probably should have marked that road in blue as a new one. The old line of the road was down there with this coming in at right angles, and those. Uh, those lines have been deleted. This wood here, there's been some minor alteration to the, uh, the area of woodland. Down here, we've got an area of woodland deleted, almost of necessity, because the, the railway runs on top of it, the symbol runs on top of it. Um, this wood has been tweaked in a complicated way with both additions and reductions, so I just put that in, in green. And then here, right at the southeastern extremity, we've got quite an area of woodland that has been deleted. If we now look at uh, Wales, just south, well, west of Bangor, what had happened there was enclosure. And at this point, the new railway crossed the line where the previous map showed a road, but the road had been uh, obliterated by enclosures. So the, that road had to be deleted and it was considered quite unacceptable to effectively not show how you got from Guy westwards. <clears throat> so the new road, or in this case, new roads, which I've shown in green, had to be added. And likewise, this wood got added immediately adjoining the railway. So what we're seeing here seems to be a principle that uh, features that cross or are immediately adjacent to the, the railway line uh, need to be shown correctly. And they can't be terminated arbitrarily. They've got to be continued until they come to a natural stop. Now, moving on a bit to Eastern England, we reach the period when the most liberal attitudes towards associated revision seem to have uh, been in force. Here, just south of Huntingdon, um, I've shown in red the line where this stream previously joined the River Ouse. It was rerouted to run along there. Um, shown in blue. Um, that is the sort of revision that really couldn't be avoided. <clears throat> Likewise, the, the new approach to the station there was unavoidable. And these roads here can be regarded as you know, impinging on the railway, so they need to be put in. But there's no reason why the hospital uh, really should have been added. That's actually separated. There's a gap between uh, the hospital and this road. 
Likewise, the buildings here. Um, and the most extreme case here is the workhouse, which is even separated from the, uh, the railway line by a main road. The, the policy seems to have been relaxed to saying that important features that could be seen from the railway line uh, close by, those could be surveyed and added. And one sees this also up in the vicinity of Lincoln, where various things get added at about the same date. If we move east from uh, Huntingdon, uh, further down the River Ouse, we find ourselves in an area which had quite extensive um, fen drainage between the, the map, the old map being first surveyed and the addition of the railway. And I've shown in green the, the new roads uh, which have been added and they've been extended until they reach somewhere, in this case, the village of Fenny Drayton down there. We have the same sort of behavior here. What I find interesting is that it was also considered appropriate to put this windmill or water engine, I'm not sure which it is, uh, immediately adjacent to the River Ouse um, on the map. I think, again, there was a, an understanding that if a road went somewhere, then it was appropriate to show what it went to. And this was regarded as going to the water engine. Now, the most dramatic uh, expanse of uh, fen drainage one comes across is further, just a little bit south from here, where there had been, when the maps were first surveyed, uh, a number of extensive open areas of water called mirrors. And by the time the railway had been put in, these had been drained and turned over to agriculture. And we see the same sort of policy uh, going uh, applied here. Uh, road adjacent to the, uh, the railway, new road, so it has to be shown, and it extends down um, to a water engine, which gets named with a descriptive name anyway. And we've got a farm here, which perhaps needn't have been shown. And this road carrying on down here has been, it would be difficult to decide where to stop it, I have to admit. So we have the whole area around Whittlesea Mere um, included. And as you can see from the amount of green on that map, a lot of associated revision took place. Now there's one quite intriguing aspect to this. If you look at the, the old map on the left and the new one on the right, then there is a great deal of commonality of name. In fact, I even wondered whether the, the names or a lot of the names had somehow been retained without being deleted and, and uh, re-engraved. But no, they, they have been um, re-engraved. The key or one of the key bits of evidence here for those who don't have uh, the, the ability to spot subtle differences in typefaces, we have Johnson's point here with an apostrophe. We have Johnson's point here without an apostrophe. Uh, and there's another little interesting characteristic. This doesn't actually read Johnson's point. The letters, if you look at them very closely, are actually P superscript L. I think what's happened is that the, uh, the crossbar from the, the superscript T has worn away, but it is slavishly reproduced here on the new map as Johnson's P superscript L. Now, what I find interesting, very interesting about uh, this comparison, let's get that out of the way, um, is that we, we lose some of the old names where they seem inappropriate. 
you know, Gosling's Island was no longer an island. So it, it's reasonable for that to, to be kicked out. We get new descriptive names like water engine added. We do not get any new proper names. We've got, I think it's seven new farms shown. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which you might imagine uh, have names which get referred to quite a lot by people wanting to say, oh, you go along to such and such. None of those appear. I think the reason behind this is that to add a, a new proper name, you needed to have the, uh, the formal arrangements of a name book. And someone had decreed that railway revision would not require a name book. Hence this rather interesting uh, approach to um, the names. So that there is a summary of what seems to me at least to have been happening. About this same time, we also have what I think may be the earliest case of the, del of the deletion of the railway. We're back to Maidley near the Grand Junction where I started and not far from Maidley you had Lisset Colliery. I think I've got the pronunciation right. And Lisset Colliery had a tramway running from pits here, past the pits there, past more pits here, and going down the valley to the Turnpike Road. And as I understand it, uh, coal was unloaded from the, uh, the, the tramway wagons onto carts and was taken into Maidley and to serve customers there and other nearby customers. Once railway had been built, it made very much more sense uh, for the, the coal to be taken by tramway to the railway line. And so you have a completely new tramway laid out here. And I've drawn that in in light blue on the old map to show where it's going. And even you know, when you look at it, the branches, there is you know, no duplication with the previous one. I've also drawn in there as purple or dark blue dots, the where new coal pits have been added. I don't know whether this is the, the complete uh, list of the um, the new coal pits that had been added by, by this date, or whether what we're seeing here is a uh, continuation of the principle that if something is going somewhere, it is legitimate to show what it's going to. And so all these coal pits are at the end of, the of a branch of the railway line, and that may be the, the justification for showing them. So, as I was explaining, this was the, the high point for associated revision. Uh, oh, quick summary of what's going on here. As you, as, the, as time goes on, <laughs> associated revision appears to become rather less in quantity. One thing that is needed or is regularly shown will be access roads to stations. Much more interest seems to be taken in these. And so here we have at Stratford-on-Avon the new access road to the station, whoops, sorry, um, which um, at this date was a terminus. What we have here was a pre-existing road, so you can effectively ignore that. And all this carried on right to the very end of the old series. So here we have 
um, the Metropolitan Line uh, going out past Chorley Wood Station. And <clears throat> the old map showed this track coming in uh, from the, the north to Currents Bottom. By the, the railway had truncated that line of road and it was altered to run more or less to the railway and to join this road here where there is a um, where the railway is on, on quite a, a steep embankment. It's interesting what we are not seeing at this date is earthworks of the new railways. Here the interestingly the railway the road has been continued to the overbridge here where it joins up with the existing uh, road network. I think this is because Chorley Wood Station is here and the, the new road is the, the access one uses to get to Chorley Wood. And we're back to doing things economically so far as the engraver is concerned, even though he now has the benefit of uh, electrotype technology. Um, the casing of the, the roads here is not broken where it should be. Um, the casing of the new road here is taken straight across the existing road. Um, actually, that's not so much a deletion problem, it's, it's, it's sloppy drawing or sloppy engraving. But basically, some things carried on right to the very end of the life of the series. To summarize then, I was looking for um, styles of railway edition. What we actually seem to have is a, a, a reaction, a way of dealing with uh, the fact that the map to which the railway was to be added has had a number of changes depending on how old it is and those will affect what needs to be shown. We also have a change in attitudes towards costs with federal economy at the very start, quite a liberal attitude towards uh, associated revision about the middle of the century and then tightening up later on. And I think that's really what was causing the local variation that I had observed uh, rather than any different styles or different approaches to um, policy in this era. So I will stop sharing. Uh, and take any questions if anyone has any questions. Well, uh, let, let me ask you, Rob, uh, about two things. Thank First, it, it is very strange that in the beginnings there is no uh, special uh, uh, special showing of uh, le level crossings or bridges or whatsoever. Can I, uh, did you find out when that when that started to be serious? Because in the 1914 edition, uh, it is very precise how how these things were 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 drawn. I haven't actually paid any attention to that. I have to confess. the The impression I have is that throughout the old series, uh, all that is done is to butt up the uh, the railway to the road. And if the railway disappears under the road, that means it's an overbridge, the road over the railway. If, it, if the road disappears under the railway, it's the other way around. But sometimes they get it wrong. And quite what was done with level crossings, I'm not sure. Richard may have paid rather more attention to that than I have. Hmm. Well, in 1914, this, this still was the fact because level crossings are shown by butting up the road to the railway. Although oh, yes, you but... know that there is a, there is a, a, there is a, a, an, uh, a metal for the road on the railway. 
But by 1914, I think you've got a, a bridge symbol, haven't you, when there is a bridge? Uh, that's right, yes. So and it's the absence you can, of a bridge you can, symbol. You can it's infer the that when symbol. there is no bridge symbol, it must be a level crossing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's oh, and the other thing about your police station, that's very right. interesting because in Holland, we had the same problem. And I can tell you that it was indeed a sort of police functionary. And there were, there were, there were no signal men in those days in our, in our view, but they were, they were actually uh, officials who kept an, an eye on the road to see whether it was, was clear. And they had, they had the power to, uh, to, uh, to give orders to people to move off. And right. they were signaling because they showed a green flag when the road was clear, but that, that, that did not show that there was a train on, on, on the track. That happened by visual telegraph. Ah. So the, the real signalman uh, enters when the block system is, uh, is in, in force. Oh, you certainly have signalmen uh, in Britain. Uh, before the block system comes in, because mm. there was there was a lot of time interval signalling going on uh, in the early years before uh, the block system was introduced. Mm -hmm. Well, in Holland, there, there was an 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 ach. Uh, there were there were little houses where these people were were housed, and they were called wachthuis, watchhouse. Right. Mm, and right. that's the function of a police station, I mm. think. Yes. Okay, thank you, um, Dunkerville. And um, I, I just wanted to chip in that we've had a, a, a quite a long chat uh, from um, um, sorry, was it David, David Andrews? Andrews? David Andrews, yeah, thank you. Um, do you want me to read this out, Rob? Well, people can read it, read it themselves. I don't. I, I think. Don't know. I think it's or, or so David long. may wish to uh, enlarge on it. Yes, are you still there, David? Would you like to uh, enlarge upon it? It's quite long. It's about uh, uh, showing of uh, straight lines on uh, maps when the uh, uh, the projections were changed uh, later on, but. Uh, it's there for everyone to look at uh, uh, if you want to later on. I, I hope I hope I hope I've made it very clear. But if uh, anybody's got questions, if I haven't made it uh, understandable, then happy to field any questions. Thank you, David. The detached voice of David Andrews there. Um, have a look at the chat while you can, folks, and uh, you can you can chat back to. Uh, Chat back to David. There's another chat just come in here from Dave Vaughan. Uh, I work on the railway. We still call signalers bobbies. Ah, oh, right. Yes. I hadn't heard that. I thought uh, John King may have noticed that um, my old friend Charlie Wood gave his name to Chorley, <laughs> Chorley Wood. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> the Wood was called Charlie. I thought that was rather nice. Any other questions for Rob, please? Thank you very much, Rob. I, I got beaten to the draw there by Michiel, but thank you very much for a, a very detailed and uh, uh, interesting talk. Um, I hope uh, I hope our guest there, Roger, enjoyed uh, sampling a Charles Close lecture with that. And mm -hmm. uh, I hope also that you're interested in railways. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yes, yes. William. William, um, William, who yeah. is that? Uh, it's Bill, Bill Henwood. Oh, Bill, hello. Hello, yes, so I'm very formal on Zoom. Um, yeah, Rob, yeah, on the Whittlesea Mere extracts, you mentioned the addition of the farms without names. You, you noted a number of names have been deleted, but I don't think you specifically pointed out that the names of the Mears were still there, even though they'd been drained. Um, do you think that's because they were still have been known, those areas were still have been known as Mears, even though they were dry? I think so, yes. I, I believe that uh, if one was farming in, in Whittlesea Mere, uh, one would still say, oh, oh I, my, my, my farm's in Whittlesea Mere, um, mm. even though the mere was now dry. I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. A bit like a polder then, Michiel. <laughs> Just wondered. 
And um, if I may, just a sec second point, uh, just sort of picking up what you, the, the extract you showed at Huntingdon, we had the, very much the same thing here at Litchfield, where they added the workhouse, which was close to the South Staffordshire Railway. They added the Trent Valley Road, which ran parallel to the South Staffordshire Railway. And they added the Walthall Road on the other side of the town. Because ironically, the, um, the roads had actually been opened between the final survey and the publication of the map 15 years earlier. But they had to wait until the railways arrived before they came back and discovered them. Mm, yes. And am I right in thinking that will be about 1850-ish? Uh, yeah, 49, I think, was the mm, first right. time they were shown. Yeah. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the workhouse opened in 1840, but that was built on one of the roads and was within sight of the railway. So obviously they then they added it. Mm. Well, thank you, Bill. Um... And uh, follow Richard Oliver's example, folks. If you've got a question to ask, just go to reactions and uh, click on raise your hand because he goes straight to the top of the list. And I can see that you're wanting to come on, as has Philip John Hall in a minute. But Richard, you, you were first. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, coming back to this uh, question of level crossings, the OS were tended to seem to have been rather slack about indicating quite clearly what was a level crossing right up to the about 1890 or so. And it's one of the things which is taken in hand when the revised version of the new series is embarked on in the early 1890s. Um, bridges, either as under bridges or over bridges, are shown um, um, quite distinctly with um, miniature um, curving abutments and so on. And sometimes the only indication you've got a level crossing is if they happen to name the so-called lodge. Um, you, it may be remembered when I gave a mm. um, talk to the CCS AGM in 2015, I, um, at the time of the publication of the first OS map, I showed a slide of one of these lodge, of lodges, um, which still survives in East Lincolnshire, with its depiction on the map. And there was a similar phase, which seems to be fairly short lived at about the same time in um, the eastern part of Yorkshire, where the um, continuation of the old series was being produced by direct reduction of the six inch of um, noting um, gatehouses, which mm. were performing a similar function of level crossing cottages. But this does seem to um, rather go um, in pits and starts. And it's something which has largely disappeared um, by the mid 1850s, I think, though it has a rather odd revival um, on the Great North and Great Eastern Joint Railway um, going north from Spalding towards Sleaford, in, um, which was opened in 18, as late as 1882. Mm. But um, on the one new series, there are um, several ambiguous points. The original new, new series published in the 1870s and 80s, which were cleared up on the revision, and there's some occasionally downright careless work, such as the handling of the Oxted Tunnel um, when the um, line from Croydon to um, Hurst Green and on to East Grinstead was finally opened in 1884, and the detail was supplied from the previous depiction of Railway Unfinished rather than by actually surveying on the ground. So there's a number of places where the line runs on an embankment at least um, 15 feet high. Nonetheless, it appears to be shown having um, overbridges, uh, which is really rather remarkable if one knows its rain. Um, and similarly, Oxford Tunnel is shown about a quarter of a mile longer than it, it actually was. And it was about the longest tunnel on the Southern Railway anyway. Well, it's, well it still is, uh, seeming it hasn't fallen down in the recent snows. Um, <laughs> but uh, one further odd point is that, um, which really concerns a new series rather than the old series with bridges, is there is a section in North Lincolnshire, um, east, uh, east from Habra, um, going towards Grimsby, where on um, uh, revised new series sheet 81, um, it, the line is showing passing over several roads and over bridges. In actual practice, the line runs on the embankment no more than about six feet high there, and it's highly unlikely there ever were such bridges, and it's a rather curious error, which was mm. sorted out pretty quickly when the mapping was revised in about 1905. Mm. 
I think that's probably enough for me for the present. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Very, very full. Rob, do you got want any more comments on that? Or uh... Uh, no, I had, uh, I was aware of uh, what Richard had written about lodges and uh, felt I couldn't add anything to it. <laughs> well, we'll have to uh, we'll have to send our. Uh... Member Stuart Dennison of Oxford along, uh, Oxted along to uh, examine. Next person to put their hand up, I think, was Philip J Philip Hall. Uh, <clears throat> yes, can you can you hear me? All right, you can. Yes, yes. good, good. Um, um, yes, my question. I have a question, and that's how tunnels were uh, shown on on the Ordnance Survey maps. If a tunnel was straight, I mean, it would be quite easy to show it. But if the tunnel was uh, had any curves in it, how, where did the Ordnance Survey get the information from, assuming that they didn't go along the tunnel surveying it? Um, did they just use the plans that were submitted to Parliament, or did they use any as-built um, drawings that might have been produced? I know this is a little bit outside the um, extent of this talk, but I'm particularly interested in the uh, when the Ordnance Survey showed London Underground lines mm. on, for example, the one inch third edition map of London and on the three inch map of London produced in the 1930s. I'm interested about where they got their information from, whether it was just parliamentary diagrams or whether it was from as built diagrams or whether they surveyed them. The impression I have and it's only an impression, is that there is a massive distinction here between um, the London underground network and the mainline system. On the mainline system, the, the tunnel being constructed was normally some considerable distance below ground level, and there was no impediment to making it straight. Indeed, it might as well be made straight because it was shorter if it was straight. And so you have, it must be, I don't think, I can't think of any examples of um, curved tunnels of that nature, of any length. I, I could give you one here. Um, the St Pancras line, when it comes out of St Pancras, it goes roughly northwards and it turns around westward and goes under the hills south of Hampstead. There are two tunnels there and I, at least one of them has, is curved. Oh, right. Um, but certainly with London Underground, uh, then uh, there was a require. There were good reasons for running under roads, and it's an interesting question where the data came from. Uh, Richard Oliver has his hand up, and I suspect he can. He is about to tell us where the data came from. Um, thank you. I, what I'd really put my hand up for was the comment on the question of curved tunnels. The Oxid. Um, tunnel is, as I say, about a mile and a quarter long, and it's on a fairly continuous curve. And this you can see um, on any um, OS um, map, there's nothing very obscure about it. It must be amongst the longest curved tunnels on a mainline railway in this country, but some, some shorter curved tunnels were used um, in order to um, preserve a reasonably high speed um, alignment. As for the London Underground tunnels, there is a series of plans in an Ordnance Survey class in the National Archives at Kew, um, which in fact are late states of the London um, five foot plans, which were prepared in the 1940s, which show the alignments of um, underground lines for showing on national grid plans. I ha have an idea that this data was obtained from railway surveys, somewhat exceptionally to the OS. Mm. But a lot of railway tunnels could be supplied fairly easily by uh, mapping the air vents along them. And sometimes, mm. once again, coming back to the Oxted Tunnel, um, you wouldn't think I'd lived in a mile or so of it for several years, would you? Um, along the top, the railway seems to have bought up quite a bit of the land rather than... Um, uh, simply acquiring um, tunneling rights from the landowners, and it was actually fenced off, and it would be a fairly easy matter to map the alignment of the tunnel from above without actually entering the tunnel of Oxted. And uh, presumably... Much elsewhere, um, uh, for example, a few miles away at Merstham on the um, Brighton line, there's both the original Brighton line and there's the Quarry line, opened in 1900, and there... Um, 
although there are quite a number of air vents and even a surveying tower the um and some spoil heaps the railway doesn't actually seem to have um fenced off the land or if it did it's long since um been taken by the um, joining farmers mm. presumably the route of the the tunnel would be shown on the deposited plans anyway It would, assuming that, of course, that the railway was built exactly on the route. Oh, yes, yes. On the positive plan, this is the old problem. But then if it, if it wasn't built exactly on the route, you probably wouldn't notice it. <laughs> this this reminds, I'm going to bring in our very patient next uh, hand raiser, John King. It reminds me, John, of that uh, awful accident a few years back where no one knew that the old... Uh, um, what did we call it? The Great Northern uh, Line, which had been built by the Metropolitan uh, into Old Street and Moorgate, actually went under a road, was showing on no one's plan. No one took ownership of it. And some developer on the surface drilled a hole straight into the northern city line. <laughs> The point was, it was not under a road. It was it oh, was under a, a development site. It was just off it. The road had moved, I believe. Or... Yeah. No, 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 no. They'd cut the corner. They'd, oh, OK. Um, John, John King, you've been very patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob, for that uh, talk. Very interesting indeed. Just an observation I wanted to make. You had that four-stage process earlier in your talk. Mm -hmm. saying that stations were added shortly before opening. One of the things that, where I've done a lot of research on the London and Southampton Railway, Act 1834 completed, well, the first stage completed 1838, was that when the first prospectus was issued for many of these early railways in the 1820s and 1830s, they very rarely talked about passengers. They talked and talked up huge figures for the carriage of freight, but in the course of the building of the um, London and Southampton, the view of the directors changed considerably mm -hmm. because of experience with the Stockton and Darlington, the Liverpool and Manchester, where mm -hmm. passenger uh, traffic had increased massively. And I think I'm correct in saying that it wasn't until about 1869, 1870, that the railways in um, Great Britain were carrying more freight in terms of revenue than passengers. But the early railways certainly did not achieve their early freight, um, what was proposed, you know, what they thought they were going to do. Um, so stations were an afterthought. And when you look at the act for the London and Southampton Railway, the only station that is implied on the route between London and Southampton is one at Winchester, although the Act did make provision for the railway to build buildings to service the railway where required, mm. but didn't actually specify any particular stations. Mm. Yes, it, it was indeed by no means, it, it was not normal for deposited plans to mention stations or for that matter, for prospectuses in many cases to mention stations. What no. I actually said was that the stations were uh, on the uh, Nottingham and Lincoln line were determined upon only a few months before the line was opened. Uh, I didn't say anything about uh, when they appeared on the map. Okay. In fact, by that date, we were on to uh, sink, uh, uh, one bite at the cherry. So they don't appear on the map until 1851, which is some years after the line was open. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, John, for your question. Rob, for your answer. Any more hands raised, please? Or just shout out if it's easier. You can unmute. I would like to ask Jerry, uh, Rob, Michael. Whether the idea that uh, farms and workhouses and whatnot were shown on the old on the old maps to make them attractive to tourists, would that be an idea? Um, I don't know. 
And when you say attractive to tourists, you are thinking of the uh, the users of the the guide uh, books that yes. I mentioned to the new railway lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the right, uh, shortly after leaving Huntingdon, you will see the new work, the new county workhouse. Um, possibly, um, I don't know. You you would need to look at uh, the the gu the guide if indeed by that date guides of that nature were still being produced. The ones mm -hmm. I've seen all tend to be very much earlier. They seem to be associated with the railways of the 1830s rather than something like the Great Northern Railway. Mm -hmm. where, where there's some somewhat like the, the famous Baedeker. Baedeker is very much railway centered. Oh, yes, yes. Um, but whether they would be that keen on drawing attention to uh, workhouses, workhouses. <laughs> I'm not at all sure. And nor hospitals, for example. Um, I think it's more a surveyor's approach to what ought to be shown. And Richard has a view on this, so uh, um, perhaps I should hand over to him. Take it away. Well, my feeling is that the workhouses, um, cases like at Huntingdon, where the workhouse was added, also I think that brickworks, which is close to the railway, mm -hmm. um, well, because they were conspicuous public works. There's a rather interesting, um, what might call a non-example of this at Lincoln, where the um, former county asylum at Bracebridge Heath was being built in 1849, but um, didn't appear on the one inch old <laughs> series, notwithstanding that the railway revisers must have been on the ground at pretty much the same time. And I think the reason for this is that the asylum may not have been very, um, clearly visible from the area around the railway where the railway revisor was at work. And so therefore the um, asylum uh, wasn't mapped, whereas the railway revisor did manage to um, map a um, somewhat puzzling branch to a gravel pit, which I seem to recall I asked Rob to investigate on the ground for me shortly after we moved to the neighbourhood when I realised what was going on. Yes, though that's not a, that's not associated revision, uh, according to my no. definition. Uh, private railway lines, or indeed railway lines maintained by the, the company themselves, uh, going to uh, a gravel pit or a colliery, were normally surveyed at the same time as the railway itself. Yes. Right. Um, John, John K King's back again. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, Rob's comments there about guides, very interesting. I, uh, if you can see that, you probably can't. It's Wilde's Guide to the London and Southampton Railway, 1839. Mm -hmm. And as Rob was saying, it's very much on your left, on your right, you can see this and that. Um, but uh, this, I, I, I had a copy of this a few years ago in a dreadful state. I recently got that in auction um, and it's superb. And the other maps in there are quite interesting. And it makes me wonder who did the surveying work because Wilde produced his own maps, of course, but was he making use of the Ordnance Survey as well? Hmm. Interesting, that, that reminds me of those um, line side um, maps, atlases, guidebooks, what have done for the Southern Railway. Uh, I, I buy a, a famous name this is escaping me um, uh, yeah they were they were done for the um that was based on order LMS, lms and southern railway in the 1930s and have been reprinted yeah. uh, they never did one for the great western um at the time pike who yes pike. Yeah, yeah. pike pike thank you <sighs> Well, there we go. Any more questions for Rob, please, folks? If not, um, don't go because I, I'm going to say something else in a minute. But thank you very much, Rob. And uh, 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 fascinating and uh, highly detailed and thought provoking talk. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. I, I should have said earlier, I hope you've all had your latest sheet lines because with it came the fabulous map you heard to uh, heard referred to earlier, the uh, general strike map of uh, 1926. I should have credited as, as well as the work done by Alex and others, Alex Kent, um, the introductory essay that's inside it, written by uh, my predecessor chairman, Chris Board, 
uh, in his 90th year, 91st year actually, uh, entitled The Secret Version of the Map of London at 1 to 20,000. And uh, I recommend all of it. It's uh, a great Christmas present, is it not? Um, I'm going to uh, also remind you that with your sheet lines came this lovely, very pink leaflet looking horribly like the last one, Richard. <laughs> but um, don't forget to put in your free publication order at the discounted price of £30 for Richard's and Roger Hellyer's new uh, Meisterwork Ordnance Survey small scale maps. Do you want to say anything about that, Richard? Uh, um... There's not really very much to say other than that um, we're hoping to be able to get it out um, in March. Um, there's been a bit of a hold up on the production because of um, our uh, little friend COVID, um, Chris Higley having been laid down recently. And I gather some of the um, plates are proving rather troublesome. And guess who supplied the raw material for some of the plates? Um, the, uh, Jerry said it was sort of Richard and Roger's um, book. Really, it's sort of Roger and Richard's book because I'm, I'm sure Roger Hellier has put far more hours and legwork into it um, in listing up the various versions of mainly the half inch and the quarter inch map families than I did in writing the um, historical introduction, if you can call it an introduction, if it when it spreads to something like 170,000 words. Um, so uh, I, I recommend it strongly, having um, had to um, spend two or three years writing the thing and uh, so on. So um, and um, 30 quid for um, 400 plus pages these days, so uh, A4 is uh, really quite good value, though I say it myself. Extremely good value. There you are, folks. Buy yourself a, a delayed Christmas present and uh, pay for it now. Enjoy it later. <laughs> but... Uh, what what a what a what a work indeed, and uh, I do recommend Richard's article in the latest sheet lines if you haven't got to it yet. It uh, makes you gasp as well as laugh. But uh, well done, Richard. Thank you. Any more points from anyone? Otherwise, I'm going to wish you all a very pleasant evening and uh, a happy Christmas. Our next talk will probably be in February. It'll probably be by Dr. John Peaty. It'll probably be on the Peninsula War mapping, but nothing is certain because I this will be an on this will not be an online talk. It will be a live talk in London, and uh, uh, details will uh, be issued shortly, as soon as I've haggled the place and the time. But um, thank you all for coming, and uh, goodbye and happy Christmas. Thank you, Rob.